All set. Great. Good afternoon. Oh, uh, are we ready? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, my fellow patriots. I am Judge Michael Warren, and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to uh, today's rendition of um, our Patriot Academy. Uh, I am Judge Michael Warren, co-host of uh, Patriot Lessons American History and Civics podcast and co-creator of Patriot Week. And we're very excited that you're joining us. Uh, for our second annual and first virtual Patriot Academy. Patriot Week renews America's spirit by deepening the appreciation of our founding first principles, founding fathers and other great patriots, vital documents and speeches, and flags that make America the greatest nation in world history. Many of our current holidays have become over-commercialized or have lost their deeper meaning. Uh, we need to reinvigorate our appreciation and understanding of America's spirit. Anchored by the key dates of September 11th, the anniversary of the terrorist attacks, and September 17th, uh, which is Constitution Day, the anniversary of the signing of the Constitution uh, by our founding fathers, the schedule for each day has a separate focus. Patriot Week was started in 2009 when my then 10 year old daughter Leah pounded on the table and demanded a new celebration for America. Patriot Week has been recognized by the US Senate in a unanimous resolution last year. We're hoping that another one will be coming uh, forthwith uh, for this year, as well as by over 15 states with official gubernatorial and legislative proclamations and resolutions. Scores of K-12 schools, public charter, private and home universities, law schools, student groups, community organizations like Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis's, senior centers, religious organizations and others, cities, counties, courts, law firms, businesses, senior living communities, libraries, hospitals, historical groups, private homes, public officials and others engage in a wide variety of grassroots activities that have included panel discussions, speakers, lesson plans, festivals, parades, picnics, commemorations. Uh, we've even hosted a gubernatorial debate, had a contest for students, uh, a variety of different uh, ways to engage. Uh, today we'll be discussing the themes of September 13th. And on uh, September 13th, we commemorate the indispensable first principle of the social compact, the indispensable man, George Washington, the Congressional Resolution, forwarding the Constitution to the states for ratification, and the current United States flag. We will begin by addressing the first principle of the social compact. America was unique in the course of human history because when we declared independence, we did so in defense of certain founding beliefs, what we call the first principles. John Adams, founding father and second president of the United States, observed in 1776, that we ought to consider what is the end of government before we determine what is its best form. Adam's prescription is peculiarly American. The United States of America, after all, was the first modern nation that was founded uh, its government on the basis of an end, a purpose, the preservation of freedom. America's first principles arose from a revolutionary understanding of politics and government, origin originating from English philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, John Milton, Algerie Sidney, and the radical Whigs, the radical wing of the English parliamentary opposition during the 1700s. The Founding Fathers philosophy holds that adherence to certain first principles is a prerequisite to a free and just government. Each first principle is an indispensable cornerstone of the American Republic, and each must be well understood to secure our freedoms and continue the success of our grand experiment in self-government. At the core of these beliefs are laid out in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, and it declares, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter and abolish it and institute new government, laying its foundation in such principles and organizing such power, organizing its power in such form as to them to seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. From these eloquent sentences, we can identify six first principles. The rule of law, unalienable rights, the social compact, 
equality, limited government, and the right to alter or abolish an oppressive government, that is revolution. Throughout the Academy, we will be addressing each of these in turn. So we've already, as well as, uh-oh, am I frozen? Okay, can, so I'll go back. I'm sorry, I think I froze for a second. For these eloquent sentences, we can identify six first principles, the rule of law, unalienable rights, the social compact, equality, limited government, and the right to alter or abolish an oppressive government, that is revolution. Throughout the academy, we will be addressing each of these uh, one each day. The founders believed, uh, and we've already addressed the re uh, revolution and the rule of law, so now we're moving on to the social compact. That the founders believed in the social compact is clearly revealed in the phrase from the Declaration of Independence, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, there are two aspects to this first principle. The first holds that legitimate governments are instituted among the people. The second is that the just powers of the government are derived from the consent of the people. So the people are the basis for both of these. Like the other founding first principles, the founders derived much of their understanding of them from the English philosopher John Locke and similar like-minded philosophers. Locke and the founders not only believed that all individuals were vested with unalienable rights, and we will be addressing this um, in, in another lesson uh, this week, but those rights are given to the people by the creator. So they believed in this very intensely. They also believed that those rights are not absolute. They understood that the right to grow wheat or some other kind of crop does not permit one to steal someone else's bread. In a state of nature, each person was free to pursue his or her own interest, food, shelter, love, family, material goods, without regard to established rules of conduct. In utopia, each person would exercise those rights granted by nature without interfering with the rights of others. However, utopia is St. Thomas More's fantasy and conflict is inevitable without established laws and norms of conduct. Cain possessed the right to farm and make offerings to God, but his jealousy did not grant him the right to slay Abel. As the story of Cain and Abel reveals, conflict arises from man's very nature. After all, there appears to be an infinite number of causes for strife. Greed, fear, hate, love, pride, vainglory, competition, desire, lust, religion, resources, power, evil. I've seen evil in person in the courtroom, so don't think there isn't one. There is such a thing. Uh, mental illness, addiction, and jealousy being just some of the more obvious examples. Of course, as Locke observed, a person unjustly assaulted by another may by the fundamental law of nature protect him or herself, their family, and property. So the result of that is war. Uh, the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes likewise explained in his treatise Leviathan, out of civil states, in other words, with no governments, there is always a war of one, of everyone, excuse me, against everyone. Here be it as manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, again, no government, they are in the condition which is called war, in such war as is of every man against every man. In such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, or use of commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing, such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no count of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, in short. Locke, Hobbes, and the founders posited that to escape such war, individuals united in civil societies and established governments to secure the peace by delegating their individual authority to the greater society. Locke noted that there could be no freedom without a social compact of laws, because liberty is to be free from restraint and violence from others, which cannot be when there is no law. James Madison reflected that if men were angels, 
no government would be necessary. But we know men are not angels. Hamilton likewise noted that the government becomes necessary to restrain the passions of man. Thus, paradoxically, legal restraints are necessary to preserve liberty. By relinquishing certain rights of nature, an individual gains overall security. So a kind of simple example, um, in a state of nature where there's no government, somebody comes in and steals your car, beats up your wife or a family member and flees, uh, in right of self-defense, you'd have the right to chase them down and beat them up, take back your car and exact punishment on them uh, for what they did. Um, but then of course, there would be uh, retribution perhaps from their family members. And that's what we call vigilante justice. And, and that's a very, very dangerous situation to be. So instead of enforcing those rights ourselves, we have a fire department, a police department, uh, we're customs agents, an army. Uh, so from the local all the way to the national, uh, we are in charge of, uh, or we've delegated some of our, what otherwise would be national rights to the government to preserve our society and therefore our individual rights. Without each individual's relinquishment of some of his or her natural rights to society, as I just stated, chaos would reign. To secure one's life, liberty, and property, one has no choice but to unite in a civil society that will defend those rights in exchange for the relinquishment of others. By, quote, entering into the social compact, though the individual parts with a portion of his natural rights, it is evident that he gains more by the limitation of the liberty of others than he loses by the limitation of his own. So that in truth, the aggregate of liberty is more in society than it is in a state of nature, unquote. That's from James Wilson. He was a leading founding father, ended up serving on the United States Supreme Court. And he explained that before the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention that adopted and ratified the United States Constitution. So his point is, you're gonna have more liberty, ironically, uh, it, with a government than without one. Individuals therefore relinquish the right to judge and punish others for wrongdoing and delegate that authority to law enforcement and the justice system. The alternative is vigilantism, with all of its accompanying Hobbesian horrors of war against war, the war against all. Similarly, individuals relinquish the right to create their own rules of conduct by delegating that authority to legislators so that a universal system of laws may provide uniformity, certainty, and consensus in daily life. The American experiment was founded on this understanding of the social compact. The sentiments of Wilson and Madison and Hamilton and others attending the Constitution Convention were often echoed in the revolutionary era. The Massachusetts Constitution, uh, which was adopted in the wake of the revolution, for example, recognized that, quote, the body, and was written by James, excuse me, John Adams, quote, the body politic is formed by a voluntary association of individuals. It is a social compact by which the whole people covenants with each citizen and each citizen with the whole people that all should be governed by certain laws for the common good, unquote. That this was a widely held sentiment is confirmed by a passage written by the Constitutional Convention in the letter accompanying the newly drafted Constitution to Congress that was written in 1787. So they drafted the Constitution, uh, they sent it to Congress for Congress to consider it, and so that they could send it on to the states for ratification. We're gonna learn about that in, uh, in more detail later in uh, this session. Uh, and that, in that letter to Congress, the Convention wrote, quote, Individuals entering into society must give up a share of liberty to preserve the rest, unquote. This understanding that the individuals establish the government to protect their rights leads to the second aspect of the social compact, that the people form the basis of the government and must consent to give the government its authority. Robert Bates, a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, explained that, quote, in every free government, the people must give their assent to the laws by which they are governed. This is the true criterion between a free government and an arbitrary one, unquote. In reality, no government really asks uh, directly each individual to consent to its governance or to approve such exercises of government authority. But in America, citizens are free to immigrate or stay. Individuals pay taxes, which are voted upon by the people. Individuals freely take advantage of the security and benefits offered by the state. And the government derives its authority directly from the vote of the people. America clearly embodies the first principle of the social compact. Perhaps uh, a few ancient 
cities and short-lived republics justified their governments through the consent of the people. Uh, but the, in the modern age, at least, none explicitly embraced the principle until the establishment of the United States. As James Wilson explained, when he was a delegate before the Constitutional Convention, remember this is the guy that served on the Supreme Court and all that, um, he, he said that the founding fathers believed that all authority was derived from the people. Thomas Paine, a leading American revolutionary who we've already explored on 9-11, agreed that a government founded upon the consent of the people is the only mode in which governments have a right to arise and the only principle on which they have a right to exist. No wonder then that the revolutionary state era constitutions often declare that government of right originates from the people, is founded in consent, and instituted for the general good. Indeed, the American Revolution was so strongly motivated by the defense of this first principle. The cry of no taxation without representation was directly derived from this principle. And I would note that the Declaration of Independence has a, has a long list of uh, grievances and usurpations uh, that uh, the founders believed justified revolting against the British. And most of them deal with British tyranny violating the social compact, eliminating consent. They closed colonial legislatures. Uh, they suspended laws that were passed by the, the colonies, uh, refused to uh, approve laws that were passed by the colonies, um, made the colonial legislatures meet in, uh, in inconvenient places. Uh, they tried to cower the, the, the colonial legislatures to do what they wanted. So this really strikes at the heart of this idea of the social compact and consent. It was just not taxation without representation. It was much deeper than that. And if you happen to be listening to our American history and civics, um, uh, excuse me, Patriot Lessons, American history and civics, uh, you'll note that we're starting to go through those grievances and we'll go into those in much greater detail in that, in that podcast series. But in addition to this philosophical theory, the colonists had the historical experiences I was just mentioning of living in a social compact in consent, the New World presented um, immigrating Europeans a novel opportunity to begin anew. Eager to escape the cruelties of Europe or to find riches, they chose to settle in America, either as free men or as indentured servants, and establish societies in the wilderness. The theory of the social compact came to life in America. While Locke and Hobbes had only theorized about the origins of primordial societies, America became a living experiment of societies created through the compact of the governed. The Puritans are perhaps the best known example. And Alexis de Tocqueville, a French observer wrote, Puritanism was not merely a religious doctrine, but it corresponded in many points with the absolute democratic and Republican theories. Puritanism was scarcely less a political than a religious doctrine. No sooner had the, Im had the immigrants landed on the Barren Coast than it was their care to constitute a society. The Puritans entered into a social compact by subscribing to the Mayflower Compact in 1620. Perhaps the first time in history, the Mayflower Compact placed into practice the theory of the social compact by establishing a community government by a written agreement signed by the governed. The Mayfair Compact, compact provided as follows, quote, in the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten do by these presents solemnly and mutually ourselves together into a civil body politic for our bettering, ordering, and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof, do and act, constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and convenient uh, constitutions and offices from time to time as shall be thought most um, meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, and to which we promise all due submission and obedience. And that, that's some old language there, but basically they said, we're going to make a social compact right here and now, and we're all going to follow it. Other colonies also established havens of freedom based on the social compact, and putting aside the shameful and dreadful realities of enslaved Africans and the killing and displacement of American Indians, and that's a, a huge topic uh, that we need to acknowledge. Uh, and we will return to in, in, in other uh, form as well as here um, in uh, the Patriot Academy, the European immigrants consented to come to America and to begin a new life. They did so with an understanding of how their lives were to be governed. They were willing participants in a new social compact. Now, don't get me wrong, the colonial charters were very different. Some are royal charters, that is a colony that was basically owned by the king. Some were owned by individuals like William Penn, he owned Pennsylvania, and others were set up in other ways. 
and almost none of the settlers had much of a say in how they were established. But remember, the colonists chose to go there, and the colonies quickly had representative assemblies that were intended to help fulfill the idea of the social compact. So it was by no means a perfect fulfillment of the idea of the social compact, but it was really getting there and was monumental in the course of human history. Don't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good, and the social compact was coming into reality in a more robust way than anywhere else in the world. After the colonists declared independence, a second opportunity arose to forge a new social compact. In fact, they almost had a blank slate. The colonies had become free and independent states. The founders believed that they could create a new social compact, and in fact, they did. Each new state established a new constitution that embodied the first principles of free and just government. And a few years later, they would find yet another opportunity to do so by forging the federal constitution. But that was well after the Declaration of Independence, and that would be a, uh, but it certainly shows. Declaration invokes it, constitutions for each state also invoke it, live it, um, and then the constitution puts into practice what the founders said in the declaration. In the end, the American experience was not philosophically just based on the social compact, it was experienced as a social compact. They lived it. The social compact is an indispensable first principle, but principles don't mean much if they're not brought to life and fulfilled by courageous men and women. And perhaps the most courageous leader America has ever had is George Washington. Now to discuss George Washington with you today is David Hansma. He's a Patriot Week board member. He's gonna introduce himself and address the indispensable man, George Washington. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Judge, and thank you everyone for attending. My name is David Hansma. I am an attorney. I work at Seaburn Con in Southfield where I practice business law and commercial litigation. I'm also on the board of directors of Patriot Week and I am a director of governmental relations for the organization. And I am glad to talk today about one of our greatest founding fathers, President George Washington. And many of you will already be familiar with President Washington. And if you know about him, you know that he was not one of the leading social contract theorists of his generation. He did not leave us a great corpus of philosophical writings like James Madison or Thomas Jefferson did. But in many ways, his life was a living example of the social contract theory in action. If, as Judge Warren uh, said, and I entirely agree, if the founding of the United States was something of a self-conscious outworking of the social contract theory, George Washington was almost indispensable to that project. He was involved um, at almost every step of the way, and it's really hard to imagine the social contract that became the United States working without him. So I'd like to start with some biographical information. And then I'd like to make a few points as to how I think George Washington represents the social compact. So Washington was born in 1732 to a wealthy landowning family in Virginia. He served in the Virginia militia when he was a young man during the French and Indian War. And he rose to the rank of Colonel. Interestingly, the man who went on to become the highest ranking general in the United States did not receive a commission in the regular British Army that he had hoped to receive. So after the war, he returned to Virginia and he became active in colonial politics and he served in the Virginia legislature. He became one of the prominent political figures in Virginia and a critic of British colonial policies. At the start of the revolution, he served in the Continental Congress in 1775. And given his military experience and the almost universal respect that people had for him, the Continental Congress elected him as general and commander in chief of the Continental Army. And he served in that role for the entire war. This man who had only achieved the rank of colonel in a militia became the highest ranking uh, general in the United States. And he led what was sometimes a less than professional army to victory over the greatest power in the world at that time, which was Great Britain. After the war, this powerful, influential man simply resigned his commission and returned to private life. Then in 1787, he was nominated to represent Virginia at the Constitutional Convention, the convention that drafted and uh, signed the, what became the United States Constitution. 
And at that convention, he was again, given his uh, the respect people had for him and his position, he was unanimously elected to serve as president of the convention. And history shows us he did not really involve himself in the debate over the constitution, but his mere presence gave an imprimatur of respect and authority to what the constitutional convention was doing. After ratification of the constitution, Washington was of course elected our first president of the United States. He had planned to only serve one term, but agreed to run for a second term. He was urged to do so by both Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, who were at the time sort of in the process of forming the two first political parties. And these two men despised one another. They hated one another. But they both agreed that Washington was needed as a unifying figure. Following his second term as president, uh, President Washington retired from the presidency, uh, something he wasn't required to do at the time. There was no requirement that a president serve only two terms. He could have run again, but he chose to retire. He delivered his famous farewell address to the nation. He retired back to his farm, and he died two years later in 1799. So how does this extraordinary life represent the social contact theory? I think of four ways. First is obviously just the fact that he was simply involved in most of the great events that make up the founding of our country. Um, as Judge Warren pointed out, the founding of the United States was sort of the epitome of this Lockean social compact in action, and Washington was involved in most of it. He was in colonial politics, he was in the Continental Congress, he obviously served in the Revolutionary War, he was at the Constitutional Convention, and he served as our first president. The only major item that he missed as part of the founding era is he wasn't at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But even that he was involved in, in the sense that it was his army that backed up the Declaration, and he rather famously had the Declaration read aloud to his troops. The second way that I think Washington represents the social compact is he helped define how the institutions of American government were actually supposed to work in the context of rule by the consent of the governed. For example, there was no American army before Washington, just local militia groups. It was Washington who helped organize the army. Without his military, administrative, and leadership abilities, it's not certain that there really would have been much of a war to fight. The British likely would have rolled right over the colonies and life would be very different for us today. So Washington helped define and establish this great American institution and how it would interact with and be subservient to the civilian powers, which is something we'll touch upon in a minute. Washington also obviously helped define how the presidency was supposed to work. There was no president before Washington and the Constitution does not spell out in any great detail the job duties. So it was up to Washington as the first president to fill in the blanks. So for example, he was the first person to create an executive cabinet and fill executive jobs. He had to figure out how separation of powers would work and how the president would interact with Congress. He was the first president to have to figure out what it meant for the Senate to advise and consent on treaties. And with respect to the uh, social compact that we live under today, which is the US Constitution, Washington helped define how that would work itself out in real life. He also famously set the precedent of retiring after two terms. And no other president ever sought a third term until Teddy Roosevelt in the early 20th century. And then we had a constitutional amendment after that that limits presidents to two terms. But before that, presidents by tradition only served two terms because that's what George Washington did. This leads me to a third point, which is one I alluded to. Washington represents the social compact by the way he conducted himself, and he represented the idea of government by consent of the governed. So Washington did not rise to the rank of general by appointment of a king or by using his wealth to raise his own army like an ancient Roman general would have done. 
He was elected to that position by a representative assembly, which was the Continental Congress. And being the most powerful and respected man in the country, he served in that role only at the pleasure of the Continental Congress. And he submitted the military power to the civilian power. And then after the war, again, being the most powerful man in the country, he simply retired back to his farm. And then again, as president, he only wanted to serve one term and he was somewhat dragooned into a second term. But then again, after that, he simply retired to his farm. So his extraordinary life represented the idea of government service as just that, service to the will of the people. He did not use his position uh, to seek power for himself as so many governments did before, including obviously Great Britain with its king that was the head of state. And then the fourth point in the way I think Washington represents the social compact theory is he had the political virtue to lead his country. He, he obviously wasn't perfect. Um, Judge Warren mentioned the heinous sin of human chattel slavery that existed in the United States. And Washington was as guilty of that as any of the other founders. And which is why I said he had the political virtue. He didn't have every perfect virtue, but in political terms, he was universally respected by almost everyone. He was honest, he was principled, and he always rose above the political fray, which is something we really can't say about any of our leaders anymore, left or right. And the founders of our country believed that Republican government required personal virtue. And for the social compact to work, and for people to remain free, the people and leaders chosen from among the people must have personal virtue and morality. Ben Franklin is famous for saying, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. George Washington himself said, "'Tis substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government." And George Washington's life uh, represents that virtue and morality and is a um, is an example for his posterity and those of us living today. And with that, I will hand it back to Judge Warren. I thank you very much. David, I want to thank you for that excellent presentation about um, our founding father, George Washington. I would add a fifth, which is that he presided over the Constitutional Convention in which, uh, as, as the president of the convention, you, you mentioned it, but I want to elevate it. Um, without Washington's presence, the, the convention may never have uh, succeeded. And then he supported the constitution when it was debated. And now we live under that constitution. So um, as amended, so it, obviously extremely important. Uh, the next um, item that we will be moving to is the congressional resolution that forwarded the Constitution to the states for ratification. This is a, an, a, almost an obscure, forgotten, um, pivotal point in uh, American history. And to bring this to life is another Patriot Week board member. If you've been watching, you've seen him before in action in this Patriot Academy, but I'm gonna reintroduce him and he can flesh out his introduction to take over the floor. Alex A.R., the floor is yours. Hi everyone, Alex A.R. I'm a board member of the Patriot Foundation. I'm also an attorney who has been practicing law in Michigan for nearly 15 years. So today I'm going to be talking about ratification of the Constitution by the states. So for context, by 1786, defects in the post-revolutionary governing document at that time became very apparent. These defects include lack of central authority over foreign domestic commerce. So Congress endorsed a plan to draft a new constitution. And on May 25th, 1787, the Constitutional Convention convened at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Delegates representing every state except Rhode Island were present. The assemblies immediately discarded the idea of amending the then current governing document and set about drawing up a new scheme of government. Then Revolutionary War hero, George Washington, a delegate from Virginia, who we just heard so much about, was elected president, uh, president of the convention. During three months of debate, 
the delegates devised a federal system characterized by an intricate scheme of checks and balances. The convention was divided over the issue of state representation in Congress as more populated states sought proportional legislation and smaller states wanted equal representation. The problem was resolved by the Connecticut Compromise, which proposed a proportional representation in the lower house, now we know as the House of Representatives, and the equal representation of, of the states in the upper house, the Senate. On September 17th, 1787, the new U.S. Constitution, which created a strong federal government, was signed by 38 of the 41 delegates present at the conclusion of the convention. And as dictated by Article 7, that document would not become binding until it was ratified by nine of the 13 states. Five states, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia and Connecticut ratified it in quick succession, uh, specifically on December 7, 1787. Delaware became the first state to ratify the Constitution. Five days later, Pennsylvania became the second state to ratify. Six days after that, on December 18, 1787, New Jersey becomes the third state to ratify the Constitution. Two weeks later, January 2nd, 1788, Georgia is the fourth state to ratify the Constitution, and the following week, Connecticut became the fifth state to ratify the Constitution. Then, over a month later, on February 6th, 1788, Massachusetts became the sixth state to ratify the Constitution, and more on Massachusetts in, in a minute. On April 28th, 1788, Maryland became the seventh state to ratify the Constitution. The following month, South Carolina became the eighth state to ratify the, the Constitution. And then on June 21st, 1788, New Hampshire is the ninth state to ratify the Constitution. And having been ratified by nine of the 13 states, the Constitution is officially established. Four days later, Virginia became the 10th state to ratify the Constitution. So there were several bumps along the road during the state resolutions and confirmation process. One significant road bump was the state of Massachusetts, which ultimately led to the Massachusetts Compromise. One of the central issues Massachusetts had was originally the Constitution failed to reserve undelegated powers to the state and lacked constitutional protection over basic political rights, such as freedom of speech, religion, and press. The Massachusetts Compromise was a solution reached between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and the Compromise helped gather enough support for the Constitution to ensure its ratification and led to the adoption of the first 10 amendments, which we now obviously know as the Bill of Rights. Anti-Federalists feared the Constitution would lead to an over-centralized government and diminish individual rights and liberties. They sought to amend the Constitution, particularly with the Bill of Rights, as a condition before ratification. Federalists insisted that states had to accept or reject the document as written. When efforts to ratify the Constitution encountered serious opposition in Massachusetts, as discussed earlier, two noted anti-federalists, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, helped negotiate a compromise. The anti-federalists agreed to support ratification with the understanding that they would put forth recommendations or amendments should the document go into effect. The Federalists agreed to support the proposed amendments, specifically the Bill of Rights. Following this compromise, Massachusetts voted to ratify the Constitution on February 6, 1788. Thereafter, on July 2, 1788, a committee is formed to examine all ratifications received thus far and develop a plan for putting the new constitution into operation. Finally, at the end of the summer on September 13th, 1788, Congress certifies that the new constitution has been duly ratified and sets dates for the first meeting of the new federal government and the presidential election. And with that, I turn it back to Judge Warren. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. You need to give me a little bit more extra time. Uh, all right. 
the one thing I would say is, uh, thank you very much. That was an excellent rendition of the ratification process. And remember, it all got kicked off uh, by a resolution from the Congress uh, to send it to the states for ratification. And uh, just one quick commentary about that. That was the Continental Congress, which basically said, should we commit, should we go out of business? Should we you know, uh, commit suicide and, and be replaced uh, from the Articles of the uh, Confederation, which currently existed, to the uh, US Constitution, which is an extremely rare event, to say the least. For those of you that have been watching, um, it looks like we might have a little bit of time. We're going to keep it to an hour, but we might have a little bit of time at the end for questions. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a little chat. Um, you have to put your arrow there. You'll see there's a little chat button. Um, you can type in questions and uh, hopefully one of us can grab the question and respond uh, if we have the time. Don't feel pressured to invent a question, but we had some nice dialogue um, yesterday, and so I, I would encourage that today if you're interested in doing that. Our last topic for today uh, will be the current United States flag, and this will be presented by our flag expert, uh, John Wilson, who will introduce himself. He's another board member and talk about uh, how uh, we have come to have the current flag and what it represents. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I'll give a little history of the flag, um, and then we will um, dovetail into a fun fact, and then uh, its correlation to today's first principle, the social compact. Um, and then we'll finish up with a note on, on uh, what the flag means uh, broadly from the term sacrifice. Uh, the first official national flag, uh, formally approved by the Continental Congress on June 14, 1777, was the Stars and Stripes. That first flag resolution read in toto, resolved that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, alternate red and white, that the Union be 13 stars, white in a blue field, representing a new constellation. The layout of the stars was left undefined, and many patterns were used by flag makers. The designer of the flag, most likely Congressman Francis Hopkinson, a signer of the Declaration of Independence from Philadelphia, <coughs> may have had a ring of stars in mind to symbolize the new constellation. Today, that pattern is popularly known as the Betsy Ross flag, which we discussed yesterday. The new stars and stripes form part of the military colors carried on September 11, 1777, at the Battle of Brandywine, perhaps its first such use. Stars and Stripes changed on May 1, 1795, when Congress enacted the second flag resolution, which mandated that new stars and stripes be added to the flag <coughs> when new states were admitted to the Union. The first two new states were Vermont, 1791, and Kentucky, 1792. One such flag was the humongous 1,260 foot square foot star spangled banner made by Mary Pickersgill that Francis Scott Key saw at Fort McHenry in September 1814, which inspired him to write the patriotic poem that later supplied the lyrics of the national anthem. In 1818, after five more states had been admitted, Congress enacted the third and last flag resolution requiring that henceforth the number of stripes should remain 13, the number of stars should be always matched the number of states, and any new star should be added on the July 4 following a state's, <coughs> excuse me, a state's admission. This has been the system ever since. In all, from 1777 to 1960, after the, after the admission of Hawaii in 1959, there were 27 versions of the flag, um, 25 involving changes in the stars only. In an executive order signed by President William Howard Taft on October 29, 1912, <clears throat> standardized for the first time the proportions and relative sizes of the elements of the flag. In 1934, the exact shades of color were standardized. So I think it's reasonable to say that in the lifetime of all of us, we've known one flag uh, and uh, without it being altered in any way, shape, or form. <clears throat> um, old glory. Uh, 
the current flag and throughout its history uh, represents pride in our founding principles, pride in our virtue, pride in our nation. It's why we fly the flag in front of our house uh, on days, especially national holidays of significance. It's why we wave <coughs> tiny little flags at Independence Day celebrations. It's a message that we send one to the other about our unity, about um, our principles. The social compact, we place primacy on our obligations as citizens one to, the, to another, that we the people uh, will fight for and preserve and defend each other in our founding rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The canton of the 50 stars reflects our union. We may be 50 states, but we are one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And certainly we, those are aspirational principles that we always pursue. And certainly we have plenty of history where we fell short in those goals, but we still believe in our principles. It's the social compact. Our greatest icon, Old Glory, always has a significant place of honor for all of us. And I wanna finish up, we, we know that the flag represents certainly service to our country. And, you know, most of us, certainly a large numbers have something like this in our house, you know, representing a flag of a deceased veteran who served in our military, who sacrificed. We have one of these in our house. This is uh, based on my father-in-law, who was a uh, aviation mechanic in World War II. My father served in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge. We have a similar flag after his passing. <clears throat> that one of my brothers has. It shows the primacy of, of sacrifice and what the flag means uh, to all of us and the social compact that we the people stand in union uh, for the principles of our country. Despite all the, the rancor that we have in political dialogue, this is our unifying symbol. That's it, Judge. Well, that's quite a bit, John. That was excellent. And as an aside, my grandfather and your father may have both been fighting at the Battle of the Bulge together. That's uh, remarkable. Um, <laughs> we're not that uh, different in age, so there, there was something else going on there. But uh, Yeah. Thank you. I think you're frozen, Judge. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, John. I'm sorry, okay. my screen froze. I, I, yeah, I see Judge Warren is frozen. Yeah. Hello, Judge Warren, you're frozen. <laughs> you need to thaw. <laughs> Do we have any questions, uh, Alex? Did, or is that, is that coming through? Hello, Judge Warren. We've lost him. He's muted, I see. Mm -hmm. Judge Warren, you're muted. Michelle, they can see you too. <laughs> Well, if anyone would like to ask any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. We'll stay on and we have Alex and I think David's still here and John, since the judge is having some technical difficulties. Please let us know, we'll give you a couple minutes. I have sent a few questions to Judge Warren. I hope he answers them. Well, if you want to go ahead and resend them to the group, 
I'm not sure who spoke up and said they sent a chat. Um, there should be an option where you can send it to everyone and then I can read it or um, Alex or David or John can read it. I sent the questions, but I don't know how to forward them now. I can't find them. <laughs> Lindsay, this is John. Um, because of my upper respiratory, and I know you saw that I was struggling with that, I'm doing better. Uh, I'm on a steroid, but it's still difficult for me. If there are questions that Alex or David or somebody, if the judge comes back and answer, I'd, I'd like them to raise their hand first, if that's okay. Absolutely. People don't need to hear my cough any more than they already have. Well, rather than trying to re um, put it in a chat, if you just you're if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, is that okay, Alex and David? Yeah, that'd be great. We welcome any questions that anyone may have. So there's a question that I see that says, if we missed yesterday, is there a way to watch it? And uh, Yes, there is. It will be up at the Patriot Week website. I don't know if it's up yet. Um, you could also it is find not up it yet, on, but it should be this evening as well. Okay. You, you also can it find be, it on. You also find it on Judge Warren's Facebook page. Yes, um, that's he, true. Uh, videotaped uh, each one of these presentations, and um, you could find it on Judge Warren's Facebook as well. I have a question. This is David. Hello. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm a little confused about one item. And was the Constitution ratified by Massachusetts before the Bill of Rights was drafted? Uh, or, and, or was there some sort of, um, or was a Ma the Massachusetts Compromise document that was signed to assure that the Bill of Rights would be drafted later? Can you fill in that gap of my understanding? Yeah, sure. There was, in connection with the Massachusetts Compromise, there were several proposed um, resolutions and amendments that the Massachusetts State Legislature brought up and consistent with that. And the Bill of Rights would not have been um, established until after the um, New Hampshire ratified it on June 21st, 1788. So there is a little bit of time between when Massachusetts, which was the sixth state to ratify the, the Constitution, and in conjunction with that, they proposed several uh, amendments. And in fact, each of the states that ratified, four out of the five states that ratified the Constitution after Massachusetts, likewise adopted Massachusetts lead and also wanted similar protections. And uh, consistent with and contemporaneous with those states' uh, ratifications, they also wanted similar protections like uh, Massachusetts did. So the uh, ultimately the ninth state to ratify the Constitution was June 21st, uh, New Hampshire in 1788, which was um, after Massachusetts and other states uh, ratified it. So the Bill of Rights came after uh, the uh, Massachusetts Compromise after the uh, Constitution was fully ratified because at the time they wanted a, either an acceptance or rejection at, as it was written. And then shortly thereafter, uh, the Bill of Rights uh, came into being. And I see Judge Warren has rejoined us. And um, uh, if you haven't heard the question, uh, Judge Warren, David, feel free to um, um, ask it again. If you uh, heard my yeah, answer, so, if you have so, any support, so, please feel free. So in Massachusetts, ratified the Constitution, were they taking some risk that there would be no Bill of Rights or was there something assuring them that it would come? Um, I, I, my understanding, and Alex, you might have a different understanding, was that there was, uh, for lack of a better term, a, a gentleman's agreement that Madison would move forward and ensure that a Bill of Rights was approved. I don't believe there was a document. Okay. I think that there were assurances given as this became more and more of an issue. <laughs> and back then, of course, uh, uh, a, a gentleman's agreement really meant something, you know, that, that, that was on their honor that they would be doing that. So um, 
I am, I'm unaware of any written document or contract. So there was a risk. I mean, if J Madison had died or the Congress had rejected the request for a Bill of Rights because he didn't have the influence, sure, there was, there was a risk. And two anti-federal, so Jan John Hancock and Samuel Adams, they were sort of leaders in help negotiating this Massachusetts compromise. And um, I, th I think it was their reputation which uh, really helped you know, kind of carry this through. Thank you. Judge, I see a question. Um, I don't know if you want to handle it or I can handle it. Someone asked, is law by the Supreme Court as much a part of the social compact as law by legislature? Uh, sure. So I, I, I will, since I discussed the rule of law yesterday and we had some discussion about um, judicial review, um, that's a great question because you don't normally think about the Supreme Court as being part of the social compact. It is their responsibility, though, to ensure that the social compact uh, most manifested in, in the supreme law of the land by the Constitution um, is, uh, governs the people and that the people's will um, ends up being um, enforceable. And so I would say that, and it, you're not, you, I, I hate to hedge it here, but I, I would say that for when the Supreme Court acts within its role to ensure that the Constitution is enforced appropriately, exercises judicial review and interprets the Constitution, and it does it within, um, you could argue on the, uh, on the margins about some things, but it does, it, uh, does not usurp the authority of the legislature, the Congress or the president, uh, but moves forward in, in, a, in a good faith way of interpreting and enforcing the Constitution, then it definitely is part of the social compact um, and, and defends it. The, there are some opinions that I think could, uh, and I'll use one in the past, so not to be so controversial. The Dred Scott case uh, was one by the Supreme Court, which really went off the rails. It, it totally misread the Constitution. It said that if you had an enslaved person that was brought from the South, brought to a free territory, that um, the laws of the free territory could not apply to the slave, and basically they said, if you read it the way that um, you know, it is most expansive, the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional, that uh, any attempt to limit slavery in the territories was unconstitutional, and, and really basically said if you had a slave and you brought him to um, a, a, free, a free state, uh, that that would be um, also unconstitutional, you know, that the laws of of the free state would not apply. And I think that, that all of that is um, subverting the social compact. So I think it really becomes a case by case analysis. I think most of the, the function of the Supreme Court should be to uh, affirm and defend the social compact, which is embodied in our constitution. That's the whole purpose of it. Um, and to ensure that the laws are, are, are fairly read and applied. But in those circumstances where they simply go off the rails, then it's, it's subverting. Uh, so I hate to hedge there and say, you know, sometimes yes and sometimes no, but I think that's, I think that's the, the, the practical reality. Well, uh, that was a great question. And we are now at our uh, witching hour. So I wanna thank you. I know some of you are returning and have been, um, uh, been, been watching us uh, for, uh, you know, every session. I know some of you might be, this might be your first uh, time. I just want to thank you all very much for, for jumping on board uh, on a Sunday afternoon and um, uh, being engaged. And I hope that you learned something on the September 13th session of the Patriot Academy. Uh, we do have four more sessions. Uh, they're all going to be evening sessions, Eastern Standard Time. It's uh, seven o'clock, seven to eight o'clock. Uh, so if you um, can join us, uh, for the rest, that would be great. If you missed prior sessions, or you might not be able to watch sessions, uh, all of them uh, this week, uh, they will all eventually land on our Patriot website, a Patriot uh, Week website. So uh, look for those that come forward um, in the next uh, few weeks. Don't forget to check out Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics podcast, our Patriot Lessons TV show, our lesson plans, daily celebrations, and so much more at patriotweek.org. You can also follow us on Twitter, 
Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You might also want to check out my book. We talked about the, this here's got the current US flag on there um, called America's Survival Guide, How to Stop America's Impending Suicide by Reclaiming Our Founding First Principles in History. And many of the themes that we've been talking about today are in the book. And you can visit americasurvivalguide.com or Amazon and other online retailers. Um, the only way that we can preserve our republic and our freedoms and liberties is to have a well-informed citizenry. That's what the Patriot Academy is all about. And I'm so very pleased that you've taken the time to join us. I'd ask that you um, encourage others in your family and friends uh, to do the same and, um, and share the website and other resources that are on the website, like the podcast, Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics, and the TV shows and all those other things. Uh, it's so very important in this um, environment to really be informed and to understand uh, our founding first principles in history. Thank you again. Until next time, God bless you and God bless America.